Hello everyone, welcome to our ninth NPARC's One Million Trees webinar. Thank you all for joining us on Zoom and on YouTube. I'm Justin and I'll be your host this morning. If you're new here, One Million Trees is our nationwide movement to intensify greening and achieve our city in nature vision. And since it began in 2020, Singaporeans from all walks of life have played a part in the planting of over 270,000 trees across Singapore. These trees provide a wide range of ecosystem services, beautify our living spaces, and enhance our habitats for biodiversity. In addition to tree planting, the One Million Trees movement also comprises online activities such as virtual tours and webinars like this one. So do check out our website at TreesSG and follow us on our NPARC social media channels for updates. My colleague will also be sharing the relevant links in the Zoom chat. During our last webinar in September, we were given a closer look at the array of different vegetation types found in Singapore and how they provide homes and connectivity for our local biodiversity, as well as varied spaces for us to enjoy. Today, we'll dive deeper into this subject and focus on a locally rare and special kind of vegetation found near the sea, our coastal forests. We will hear from speakers who have experience in managing coastal forests in Singapore, Bossin from the Conservation Division and Palin from the Streetscape Division. In addition to introducing coastal forests, they will share about Labrador Nature Reserve and Coney Island, two places with rich coastal forest habitats in Singapore, and how MPARCS partners the community to conserve and protect the habitats there. After their sharing, we will also have a short question and answer session. To take part, please send your questions to Rachel as a private message using the Zoom chat, and we will try to answer as many as we can during that time. I'm sure we are all looking forward to hearing from our speakers. So, Porsin and Perlin, over to you. All right, so thank you, Justin, for the introduction. A very good morning to everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. And I'm Bosin from Conservation Division, so Managing Labrador Nature Reserve. So without any delay, right, let's right now dive into the topic today on coastal forests. So let's first start with what are coastal forests, or what is coastal vegetation? So coastal vegetation in general refers to habitats that occurs along or near the coast. So some examples of coastal vegetation include coastal forests, mangroves, sea grasses, sandy, shore, sandy shores, and rocky shores and cliffs. So these coastal vegetations have very diverse flora species, and each habitat typically has their own set of unique flora species. In Singapore, do you know that we have all the coastal vegetations mentioned earlier? We have coastal forests, mangroves, sea grasses, sandy shores, and rocky shores and cliffs. And in this map, although it's not exhaustive, are some areas where you can find these habitats. So such as the mangrove in Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve and Pasiris, the remnants of coastal forest species in Changi, coastal forests in Coney Island and Labrador Nature Reserve, rocky shores and seagrass needles are also found in Labrador Nature Reserve as well. So generally, I think it can get a little bit confusing between uh, coastal forests and mangroves as both looks alike from afar. However, when we take a closer look at them, they're actually very different habitats. So one main difference to, tell, is to easily tell the two apart is by looking at the position of their tree roots. So the tree roots of the mangrove trees are subjected to the tight levels where their roots are submerged underwater half of the time. However, the roots of the coastal trees do not come into contact with seawater at all as they are usually high above the watermark. So mangroves also have root systems adapted to the constant inundation by seawater. So they have the pneumatophores, which are essentially breathing roots. So, it's, so in the picture, you can see that the, there are the roots that are sticking out of the muds. So those are the steel roots and the prop roots as well. So these roots actually has pneumatophores uh, to help the tree in gaseous exchange. And as we look even closer to the two habitats, the substrate types are also different. So mangroves usually thrive in muddy or clay type of substrate, while the substrate of the coastal forest looks similar 
to the ones you will see in any other inland forest patches. So coastal forests also have more flora species diversity compared to the mangrove forests. The flora species composition is also different where the usual mangrove species such as the rhizophora or the Abyssinia, and these are not usually found in the coastal forests at all. And coastal forests are important habitats along the coast. They are natural barriers against natural elements, which helps to protect our coast from coastal erosion. And the roots of the coastal forest trees actually grow deep underground to tap on fresh water. And the roots in turn actually hold the soil and substrate together and preventing it from eroding due to the wave actions. It also reduces the corrosion from salt sprays brought about by strong winds of, of rather the strong coastal winds. And coastal forests also forms an important part of the nutrient cycle because the leaves, fruits, and flowers of the trees fall into the water and this actually feed the aquatic microbes that's in the water. And coastal environments are very harsh because of the strong wind and the salty environment. So the coastal tree species will have to be able to adapt to such environment in order to thrive. Hence, the coastal forest tree species have to be able to tolerate the salty environment, the ability to withstand strong winds and having fibrous husks for dispersal. So in the picture you can see on the right, this is a sea almond tree and this is the fruit and you can see the fibrous husk that it has. And since coastal tree species are able to tolerate the harsh coastal environment, they are also suitable to be planted along our streets where the conditions are harsh as well. So our streetscape division had actually planted coastal tree species along streets to showcase the coastal tree species diversity that Singapore has aligning to the natural habitats in the area. So if you walk along or drive along Congo area or around the vicinity of Labrador Nature Reserve, you, will, you, you can come to see some trees that are not usually seen elsewhere in Singapore. So such as the Barringtonia Asiatica, so which is the one with the big leaf over here, or then this is in the Pongo area, or the Melaluka Kajaputi at the, along the Labrador Villa Road leading to Labrador Nature Reserve. And these species are planted to actually showcase the coastal forests in Coney Island and Labrador Nature Reserve respectively. And today, my colleague Pauline and I will introduce to you all about the coastal forests at these two locations. So where is Labrador Nature Reserve? Labrador Nature Reserve is located at the southern part of Singapore and is the smallest out of the four nature reserves in Singapore. It is only 22 hectares in size and it has rich historical history. So Labrador Nature Reserve forms a significant part of Singapore's history where it is a part of Singapore's defense strategy in the 19th century, as well as during the World War II to, to defend Singapore from any enemy that comes from the Southern coast. So it is also where the Dragon Tooth Gate is, or also known as the Long Yaman, which is a critical navigation marker used in the 1800s. And this famous, uh, this particular structure was, it was actually used by Cheng He, and he recorded the use of this structure for his navigation back, back at that time. And there, also, there is also the obelisk structure, which marks the most southern part of Singapore before land reclamation happened. So if you visit the playground area currently in uh, Labrador Nature Reserve, do try to spot this structure. And actually this is where the most southern part of Singapore used to be at. So although Labrador Nature Reserve is small in size, it comprises of many various habitats. So in fact, it consists of all the coastal vegetation as mentioned earlier. Labrador Nature Reserve has the coastal forests, has seagrass meadows, a sandy beach at the Bukit Chermin area, the last natural rocky shore on mainland Singapore, and a mangrove at the Belaya Creek. So given its small size, it has very diverse habitats, and these habitats support the highly diverse biodiversity in the area. And Labrador Nature Reserve is home to approximately 250 flora species, more than 100 species of birds, 41 species of butterflies, 10 species of dragonflies, and 15 species of mangrove. And the diverse flora species diversity is important for the fauna that can be found in the Rodon Nature Reserve. And today, I'm going to share with you some species of coastal plants that I find them interesting. So for instance, the Polocarpus polystachys is also known as sea tick, which is critically endangered in Singapore. And this is the tropical version of, of a coniferous tree. And typically we find coniferous trees in the temperate countries, but this species is a true coniferous tree as well. 
It has the typical coniferous tree characteristics where the leaves are narrowly lens-shaped with thick leathery leaf blade. And the narrowly lens shape of the leaves allows the tree to withstand the strong winds along the coast. And the tree form in, term, in terms of the direction that the tree is bending to, right, can actually tell you the direction of the wind. And since it is a conifer, it does not bear flowers. Instead, it has cones which contain seeds for reproduction. And the cones, when mature, has large red receptacle, as you can see in this photo, the large red receptacle. And this actually attracts the birds and bats to feed on it. And next, we have the Pitosporum ridii. This is another uh, rare coastal forestry species on mainland Singapore, and it can only be found in Labrador Nature Reserve. And it, it is the only known location on mainland Singapore right, where this species is found, and there is only a few uh, individual in Labrador Nature Reserve only. And this species is named after the first director of Singapore Botanic Garden, Henry Nicholas Ridley. And this species fruits profusely, and the fruit in, is orange color when ripe. So it provides food for birds and bats residing in the nature reserve. And the flowers are aromatic, which may attract bats and insects for pollination. And the Omocarpum cochichinensis is a critically endangered plant, which is under MPARC's species recovery program. And this is a legume species or in the Fabaceae family, which is very important in our coastal ecosystem. So it is known for its nitrogen fixing ability where they are able to fix nitro atmospheric nitrogen into nitrogenous based compound, which is an essential nutrient for the plant to grow. It has whitish flowers and occasionally with red or purple lines on the flower on the petal. And the flowers are likely to be pollinated by insects. So what I've introduced so far are the rarer coastal forest species in Labrador Nature Reserve. But there are also some common coastal forest species that you can find, and you can try to spot them in Labrador Nature Reserve as well. So first, there is the Cyzigium grande, also known as sea apple. And this is a common coastal forest species that can be also found along our streets. So it is closely related to the jambu fruit that you can find in the market. So it has broad elliptical leaves and white flowers that appears puffy and fluffy. And the puffy flowers produce nectars, which, at, which attracts birds, bees, and butterflies. The fruits are actually an important fruit source for the bats. It typically mass flowers during the wet season, especially after a long dry spell. So given the rainy season recently, right, you can try to look up for these uh, white puffy flowers as you walk along the streets. And next, there is also the Barringtonia asiatica, also known as sea poison tree, which I mentioned just now earlier, uh, that it can be found along the Pongo area as well. So although this particular tree is critically endangered, it is found commonly in Labrador Nature Reserve. As its name suggests, the fruit is actually poisonous to fishes. And the fruit and seed contain a compound called saponins, which was used by people to hunt for fishes. And the flowers are pink, puffy, and fragrant, which are attractive to pollinators, such as birds and bats. So another common coastal plant is the Oxycerus longiflorus. It is a semi-woody climber that climbs the trees in the coastal forest in Labrador Nature Reserve. And the species name is Longiflorus, and in Latin means long flowers. Hence, these flowers, these, uh, the flower of this species are really long, and it's at least 4 cm long. And the flowers are also fragrant. So if you're familiar with the fragrance of a jasmine flower, the flower of this species smells exactly like the jasmine flower. And the flowers produce nectar, which attracts butterflies. So apart from plants, right, a particular species of cricket is also unique to coastal forests in the Labrador Nature Reserve. And this is the Labintas Due, and it's also known as Boas Cricket, which is unique to coastal forests and mature secondary or primary forests. And this cricket is actually described locally in Singapore. And it's only known to be found here in Singapore and Indonesia only. So out of only a few places in Singapore that this cricket is known to be found, it is only found in high abundance in two particular locations. And there are none other than the Brunel Nature Reserve and Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. And they play an important role in the ecosystem as they are found in the undergrowth of the forest where they feed on decayed organic matters, contributing to the nutrients recycling within the ecosystem. However, despite having all these interesting species, 
the coastal forest in Labrador Nature Reserve is not immune to threats from non-native species. So in collaboration with NUS, a three-year three year study in Labrador Nature Reserve has revealed that non-native species such as the MacArthur's palm, which is on the left here, and the arrowhead vine on the right may be hindering the natural regeneration of the coastal forest. And the research also showed that removal of weeds, which are essentially the non-native species, actually increases the native tree seedling recruitment and reduces the native tree seedling mortality. And what this implies is that the removal of weeds may encourage natural regeneration of the coastal forest in the Rodon Nature Reserve, where more native tree seedlings will have the potential to survive until adulthood. Hence, you can actually play a part in conserving this vulnerable habitat by volunteering with us in our invasive species management. So to complement the efforts in invasive species management, we are also restoring and enhancing the coastal habitats in the Labrador Nature Reserve. So as announced last Sunday, there is a forest restoration action plan for Labrador Nature Reserve, which built on, on earlier efforts to safeguard and enhance the nature reserve for biodiversity conservation. And 5,000 coastal forest trees will be planted to restore and enhance the coastal forest habitat. So this will in turn strengthen its ecological and climate resilience in the long term. So a 2.5 hectare coastal forest, so which is this light green area, a 2.5 hectare coastal forest will also be restored along the coast, which will form the buffer area to the coastal hill forest at the top of the hill in Labrador Nature Reserve. This will increase the ecological resilience of this unique and vulnerable habitat in Singapore. So the restored coastal forest will also provide shelter and food for many biodiversity, including the critically endangered straw-headed bubu or, the, or other migratory birds during the migratory season. It also safeguards the continuity of many rare and endangered species of plants, such as the critically endangered deep trees conjugata, which is over here in this center, the picture in the center, or the sun fern, where Labrador Nature Reserve is the only place that you, can, that you can find this species apart from the military areas in Western areas of Singapore. And what is, fascinating, what is fascinating about this species is that it is an Asian species that dates back millions of years ago. It has relatives that are preserved in million year old fossils found in all parts of the world. And it is called the sun fern because the fronds looks like sunburst. So if you look at the fronds, it's like exploding. So it's like a sunburst. And this species is usually found in higher altitude between 300 meter to 1,700 meter in Peninsula Malaysia. But in Singapore, it is found at just sea level. And so it is actually very important for us to preserve and protect this particular species in the Labrador Nature Reserve. And other coastal plants with high conservation value, such as the Ocrosia oppositifolia, which is on the right here, which is previously known to be nationally extinct, and the critically endangered Cerbera manghas, which is a rare pong pong tree species, and many more species will be planted in this forest like restoration plan. So there will also be a new coastal trail a few years down the road, which will allow public like yourself to enjoy and learn about these interesting species in Labrador Nature Reserve. So do come and visit Labrador Nature Reserve to take a look at all these interesting species and features of a coastal forest. So you can also learn more about Labrador Nature Reserve by viewing the 1 million, three, 1 million tree virtual tour on coastal forests on YouTube. So now I will pass the time to Pauline to bring you through another interesting coastal forest in Singapore. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Boston, for the very in, uh, interesting and informative sharing about coastal forests and Labrador Nature Reserve, and Justin earlier for the introduction as well. So hi, everyone. My name is Perlin, and I am a streetscape manager with the National Parks Board. And for today's uh, webinar, I will be sharing or restoring the coastal forests of Coney Island Park. 
Okay, for those who don't know about Coney Island Park, so this is a 100 hectares island uh, located off the northeastern coast of Singapore in Pongo. So I've start this in the map of Singapore here uh, in the right. And um, if you look at the, the park map uh, for Coney Island, you would see that it's currently connected by two land bridges to the mainland with the uh, left bridge um, connecting the west entrance of the park to Pongo settlement and the um, right uh, bridge connecting the east entrance to Lorong Halus and uh, Pasiris. So these land bridges connecting to the mainland makes the park very accessible uh, by walking or cycling and also best explored this way. But if you're visiting, do note that the parks only open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. as there are no lights in the park at night and uh, we want the island inhabitants to actually uh, have time to rest. So Coney Island Park is a rustic park and what we mean by this is that we try to keep the facilities as basic as possible and uh, so you'll find you know gravel trails and log benches and log stools and things like that um, and we also take uh, several initiatives to actually uh, allow biodiversity to thrive in the park such as by closing the park at night and we ask everyone to respect that. Um, the park is also home to diverse habitats as well as flora and fauna, such as the ones uh, shown in this picture here, in the slides, uh, in the slide here. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. And it is also a prime bird watching spot with over 80 bird species actually recorded um, on the island. Uh, and so pictured here is actually a bird hide that you can find in the park where bird watchers can use to stand beneath uh, and be, you know, concealed while bird watching and also interpretive signages all around the park depicting the different bird species that you can find in the island. So uh, Coney Island Park is also ecologically sustainable and um, we say this because we try to upcycle, you know, fallen trees inside the park, in the forest, uh, into furniture, such as, you know, the directional signages, the lock benches, the lock stools, and even the playset equipment for the little ones. Um, this means that, you know, we don't actually have to take any fallen trees off the island, and they're also being put to good use. And if we actually don't have any use for them, we also live them in the forest because we want to, you know, create habitats for wildlife, including the family of smooth-coated otters that actually call this island home. We also employ rainwater harvesting for the two toilets that we have on the island, so the water is not portable. Um, now we know a little bit more about Coney Island. Did you actually know that Coney Island Park wasn't always known as Coney Island as well? So this island uh, used to be known as Pulau Serangoon or Serangoon Island. And this is name is actually still in use today, as you can see from this Google map uh, screen grab that I have taken to uh, show that it's still like uh, reflected as Serangoon Island today. So the island was originally 13 hectares in size. Uh, which is about a tenth of its current 100 hectares, and most of the island was actually reclaimed. And if you were to look at this old photograph of Coney Island here, you would be able to see that there were actually no land bridges connecting it to the mainland in the past, so people had to take boats to get there. In the 19... Uh, 36 to 1950 period, the island was also known as Hopper Island because it was owned by the All Brothers of uh, Hopper Villa, uh, who actually bought the island to be their vacation home. Oh, I'm sorry. Then in the 1950s, the island was bought over by a Singapore Indian businessman, Mr. Gulang Mahmood, who envisioned the island to be a leisure resort, all of which were inspired by the Coney Island of New York. But unfortunately for Mr. Gulang Mahmood, his island, uh, his grand plan didn't quite take off, but the, uh, the name actually did stick around, which is why we know Coney Island Park as Coney Island Park today. Um, the island then passed hands through many different owners while remaining open for recreation activities. And if you were to see the two pictures that I've attached in this slide, you will see an old signage of Coney Island, as well as an old bin, which were all relics of that time. And the old sign was uh, what used to actually greet visitors when they disembark from their boats uh, onto the island. So definitely keep a lookout for that when you visit. In the 1970s, the island was returned to the state for reclamation uh, to its current 100 hectares. And uh, unfortunately though, uh, further recreational plans for this island were halted until the, uh, the park actually reopened in 2015 as part of the Pongo 21 master plan um, under the management of the National Park Board. So I've uh, included some pictures of you know, the gates of Coney Island that you would see uh, today if you're visiting as well as the gravel track that uh, runs throughout the island. So as colorful and interesting as its history is, um, Coney Island is also, you know, uh, has a whole diversity of like different habitats. And this includes our coastal forests, the Kadrina woodlands, the grasslands and the mangroves. 
So for the purposes of today's uh, webinar on coastal forests, I'll be talking a lot more about coastal forests and Cadrina woodlands, but I definitely want to uh, recommend everyone to go check out the grasslands, and that's in the area three and four of the park, as well as the mangroves, where there are integrative signage, so it should tell you a lot more about this habitat. Um, and a diversity of habitat also means a variety of wildlife, right? So uh, on this slide, I have you know, included some pictures of all the different kinds of wildlife that you can find on the island. So in the coastal forest and Cadrina woodlands, we'll be able to see the king crow butterfly and why this uh, butterfly species is um, quite commonly spotted in Coney Island is because the caterpillar of this butterfly actually feeds on the leaves of the pong pong tree. So the pong pong tree is a coastal species uh, and is frequently planted in Coney Island Park. Um, in the park, also do keep a look out in the sky to try to spot, you know, the white bellied sea eagles uh, circling in the air as we know that they are, you know, a pair that actually breeds and nests on the island. And also look out for the smooth-coated otters. We have two families that actually are use the island as a place of refuge. Sometimes you may spot them in the water, or if you're lucky, they might actually come onto land. And if you're in the grasslands area, look out for the scaly breasted munia. So this is a grassland bird species. Uh, it's quite small. It forages in flocks um, and it feeds on grass seeds, uh, which is why you can find them in the grasslands. And look out for the, you know, the trees near to the grasslands and you might be able to see this intricately woven nest of the bio weaver. So this nest, you know, uh, the bio weaver has created this nest and uh, on the thinner outer branches of the acacia trees uh, so that they can actually deter predators from actually getting to their nest. So definitely keep a lookout for that. It's really fascinating to see. And in the mangroves, uh, look out for the long-tailed maquettes. So we do have a troop of long-tailed maquettes or what we know as the, what we also call the crab-eating maquettes in, uh, in the park. So definitely if you're visiting to, uh, you know, ensure that your belongings are you know, don't bring any plastic bags and then keep your belongings in your bags and things like that uh, because we do have the maquettes in the park. Um, but these long tail maquettes are sometimes seen at the mangroves area, frolicking in the mangrove streams or feeding on the fruits of the coastal trees in the area. And if you are standing, you know, near the mangroves at the, uh, at the estuary area, look out for the rodong snails or the mud skippers in the water. And if you're really, really lucky, you might be able to see the black tip copper leaf hunter. That's the this uh this picture here so this uh, i've included this in my slide because this is really cool um it's a predatory long-legged fly that was actually recorded in singapore only for the very first time um in coney island park in 2019 so yeah definitely try to keep a look out for that in the mangroves area so uh going back to you know the habitat diversity of the park so prior to the development in 2014 um the Vegetation in the park was actually predominantly Cadrina. So we have Cadrina woodlands everywhere in the park. And this is what gives the island its very characteristic, you know, look of a temperate forest, as you can see in this picture here. And this is also what, you know, brings uh, people to actually Coney Island, you know, for photography, because this very unique and beautiful habitat uh, is not commonly found in a lot of different places in Singapore. And it's especially popular with wedding photographers as well. So if you, uh, for the younger people listening to this uh, webinar on, on YouTube, uh, you may have a few friends who may have had their photos taken, uh, their wedding photos taken in Coney Island Park. Um, so the Katrina, while it resembles a conifer, is actually not a conifer at all. And it's actually an angiosperm, so which means it's part of the flowering uh, plant family. So it is uh, not related at all to the non-flowering um, pine family or the gymnosperms, which the conifers belong to. Uh, it is also native to Singapore, which not many people may know, just because of how it looks. And it actually has a, quite a wide distribution range, with it also being found in Southeast Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. The male and female flowers of the Cadrina are dioecious, uh, which means that they are found on different plants, on separate plants, and they are wing pollinated. Um, which, uh, which is why you might be able to find you know, the male and female Cadrina trees actually relatively close to each other to facilitate this pollination. The, and what we also know as the, you know, the leaves of the, the Cadrina or the pine needles, or we refer to it as pine needles, are actually called cladodes, and these are modified stems. Um, 
as you can see in this picture here, and what are the, actually the true leaves of the cadrina have actually been reduced to these tiny teeth-like scales actually connecting two of the stems. So if you actually uh, go to the park, pick up you know, one of those fallen uh, pine needles, and then like, you can pull them apart, and you can actually try to observe these tiny little leaves uh, that connect the two of the stems. And uh, the seeds of the cadrina are actually these flattened uh, winged nuts that actually uh, um, are dispersed when the, um, when the cones uh, actually split open when they are ripe. Uh, so these little cones look like little durians and they're also found everywhere in the park. So definitely keep a lookout for that. And the seeds of the cadrina actually, uh, you know, have been, um, sorry, the scaly breasted munia, the grassland bird that I described earlier, have actually been observed to actually feed uh, on the seeds of this tree. Um, so how did the Kedrina actually get to Coney Island Park? So while the origins of uh, you know, the Kedrina getting to the island is unknown, right? We do know that it's actually tolerant of salt and poor soils. So it's actually often found along your sandy beach area and uh, different coastal environments. Uh, but we also know that the Kedrina is frequently planted as a windbreak and to stabilize coastal sand dunes. And it's sometimes also used as soil improvers as the roots of the Kedrina actually form this nitrogen fixing association with soil microbes. So these two reasons may actually suggest that you know, uh, we might have intentionally planted the Kedrina uh, in the park uh, after the reclamation work of the 70s to help stabilize the area, um, the, sand, the sandy area. And how did the sorry? And how do you know the Kedrina, you know, get to everywhere and dominate the landscape? And this is because this is a very hardy and fast-growing species. It's also sun-loving, which uh, probably is very advantageous uh, for it when uh, after the reclamation, when there were lots of you know exposed area with high light exposure. And also very interestingly, the cadrina actually produces toxins. Uh, these toxins are not harmful to people, but they do prevent the growth of nearby plants. So they are actually able to suppress uh, other plants from actually establishing on the landscape. Um, and when you look at all these different factors, it might explain why the cadrina has managed to dominate uh, the landscape in Coney Island Park. So during the development of the park uh, in 2014, uh, prior to the opening, we decided you know, to undertake this ma massive effort to actually reforest um, the landscape to a more diverse coastal forest. So you can see in this different pictures here that a lot of trees were being planted and these are all uh, native coastal species that we have planted into the, into the park in order to diversify um, the, the species that we have um, in, on the island. So we actually zoned different habitats in the park. So we tried to safeguard the different habitats that we have on the island. And we also assigned different areas, different uh, planting pallets, you know, so that we could actually showcase the diversity of native coastal species that we have in Singapore. So like I said earlier as well, there are lots of interpretive signages around to actually talk about, you know, all the different flora species that you can find in the different areas in the park. So in the rest of my presentation, I will be sharing with you a few of the more interesting species that I, I think are super fascinating and you guys should definitely keep a lookout for when you are visiting. So firstly, there's uh, the Boakara Slaward. So this is Hernandia nymphae folia. This is a um, evergreen uh, native coaster tree that is presumed to be nationally extinct. Uh, and so Coney Island Park was actually the first location that was uh, that it was being reintroduced into. And you can find it um, you know, in the estuary area of the park. So I've started this in the map and I'll do this for all the other species that I introduced. So you know uh, if there are any particular species that you find very interesting, where you can also find them and uh, definitely go and check it out. So the leaves of the uh, Bacara flower are waxy and resemble a water lily, which is why the scientific name Nymphae folia actually is just a literal translation in Latin uh, for leaves that resemble a water lily. So the, the flowers of this uh, Bacara flower are yellowish white and fragrant and insect pollinated. And the seeds, as I've shown in this picture here, um, actually contain 51% inedible oil. So it does look very oily and it actually uh, make it quite useful to be burned as candles because of the high oil, oil content as well. Moving on to the next species. So this is the Poco Rukam Gaja, so the Scolopia macrophylla. So it's also another uh, presumed to be nationally extinct species with its last sighting in 1953. However, it was actually rediscovered in Coney Island Park in 2014. So that was very, very exciting for us. Um, and it can be found in the mangroves, uh, along the mangrove boardwalk. 
in the park. So this is a small thorny tree with thorns on both the branches and the trunk. So you definitely want to stay, uh, keep your distance, don't get too close. Um, and the leaves even have toothed edges. So ever since its discovery, it has been added to NPARC species recovery program, where our colleagues over at the Pasi Panjang Nursery doing really good work, have been you know, propagating this species and also reintroducing them into different green spaces um, mm. and different coastal environments, such as Labrador and even Pulau Ubin. Um, sorry, um, the next species is the Paku Raja. So this is Cycus eaten data. If you think it is a palm, it's actually not one. This is a cycad, a coastal cycad, uh, a critically endangered one as well. And these two specimens uh, are the only ones we have on the island were actually rescued from a site in Katong that was slated for development. So the leaves of this uh, Paku Raja cycad are feather-like and the cones are dioecious. So just like the Kedrina, the cones are born on... Uh, the male and female cones are you know, found on different plants. And the male cones are strongly centered in order to attract uh, insect pollinators. So what's really cool about cycads, and not just this coastal cycad, but all of them are actually that they have a long fossil history and they can live up to about a thousand years. So that makes it like super fascinating. And we really hope our Pakuraja cycads in Coney Island actually continue to thrive and grow uh, to as old as that as well. So these are in the estuary area, uh, just like the Bakaras Law. So look out for these ones as well when you're there. Uh, besides trees and cycle, we also do have a coastal climber, a critically endangered coastal climber called Aganope heptophylla. So this is found in the area D and E of the park. Uh, it's usually found just you know, creeping or climbing um, on the ground. Uh, along the trail, as I've uh, shown in these pictures here. So the young leaves of this climber are known to be edible and have medicinal properties. Uh, but before you go rushing over to try to pick them and eat them, just know that the bark of the roots and the bark of the, um, this climber also contain the compound rotenurin, which is actually a compound that's traditionally used as fish poison, um, or rather to kill or stun fish to make them easier to catch. And then, um, you know, another uh, particular interesting species that we have is the silver bush. So this is uh, Sephora tomentosa. So this is a critically endangered shrub that you can find in the west and east promenade of the park uh, in our coastal meadows. So just a note to everybody that uh, most of the park has gravel trails, which may, need, which may make the park not as accessible, but the west and east promenade of the park, uh, which are actually at the two ends, of the park um, actually have barrier free access or BFA paths, which makes the, you know, those two areas are really accessible for people on wheelchairs or even families with strollers to go check out. Um, so going back to the silver bush, so the silver bush have leaves that are covered in hair on the underside and the fruit pods, as you can see in this picture here, actually resemble a string of beads and are also, you know, covered in hair. The seeds of this uh, bush actually have medicinal properties and also use as antidote in fish in food poisoning and the stings of poisonous fish. And then uh, coming to my you know, final two species I want to share with everyone. And these two species are actually quite, you know, maybe familiar to people as they are they're also commonly you know, found in our parks and gardens and along our streets. So just like Paul Singh shared earlier, you know, the coastal species have um, such amazing adaptations for the uh, harsh coastal environments, which actually make them very suitable for the harsh urban conditions of high lack exposure and urban pollution. So the first one is the katapa or terminala katapa. So this is a pagoda shaped tree with leaves that are shed about twice a year. And the leaves actually turn this very vibrant like uh, red or yellow just before they fall, as you can see in the picture. And um, the leaves are sometimes also added into aquariums because they actually release tendons of humic acid uh, that helps the fish to keep calm. So um, fish keepers may be quite familiar with the leaves of this tree. Uh, the, you know, the pulp of this, uh, the fruit of the katapank um, is edible and the kernel actually has a, very, a flavor very similar to almond, which is why it's also known as the sea almond. So this species is found all around the park, you know, but it can be found in beach area E, where there's also an interpretive signage to tell you more about it. And then finally, the sea gutta plantronella obovata. So this is a vulnerable uh, coastal tree with leaves that are coppery golden on the underside that gives the tree this very characteristic coppery golden look. Um, the flowers are greenish white and has a scent that's very similar to the fragrant pandan. 
And this is found in area D, where there's another close relative of the C gutta that's also planted there that you can definitely go check out. So um, just like Posing shared earlier, you know, even with uh, this amazing diversity that we have in the park, they are not without threats. And this includes, you know, the invasive species. So um, what we have are in, in the park is actually uh, this the Batman plant or the Zanzibar yam, uh, as shown in the picture here. So it has, it has very broad leaves and are known to be able to smolder plants, in, including trees. So these are very, this is a very fast growing non-native uh, vine. And once we see on the landscape, we actually need to move in really quickly to remove them. Otherwise, they actually spread very quickly across the landscape. Um, the second threat is what I've shared earlier about the domination of Kedrina on the landscape. So the ability of the Kedrina to actually you know, suppress the growth of other plants makes it very difficult for uh, natural recruitment of um, young saplings. And, um, and, and that's why uh, it's also a threat to our coastal forest. And weeds also, you know, like uh, Bossy shared earlier, also do play a part in that. And find, and Thirdly, the impact from visitors. So what we mean by this is that sometimes we have visitors who enjoy the park, but they do stray off the trails, they bash into the vegetation, and they may unknowingly or unintentionally actually trample on these young saplings that are trying to recruit naturally onto the landscape. So before these young saplings are even able to establish, uh, they might be just trampled to death. And the man-made trails that actually then created are um, actually have may have contributed to also coastal erosion of our sandy cliffs area. So this is why we also do ask all our visitors to the park to, uh, to stay on the trails uh, so that they can actually help us protect our coastal forest. Okay, I've said a lot in my presentation about you know, all the things that you can find. And so I hope everyone's really excited to go down to Coney Island Park and check it out. Um, but if you want to go one step further, you may come and volunteer with us. So since our opening in 2015, uh, our reforestation efforts have neither stopped nor slowed down. And um, the team over at Coney Island Park are still actively you know, carrying out habitat enhancement efforts and invasive species management as well. And we're not going about this alone. So we are trying to you know, engage our community, bring them on board, uh, join us in our efforts. And in doing so, you know, share about the coastal plants that we have, the importance of coastal forests, and uh, also build community ownership. So if that sounds really interesting to you, uh, definitely come join us as either a Coney Island Park volunteer or via the One Million Trees movement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Posse and Pauline, for that really informative sharing. Uh, we learned from you about two interesting places with rich coastal forest habitats in Singapore, the wondrous flora and fauna that's found there, and what's being done to conserve them. So now let's move on to our Q&A session. Thank you to everyone in the audience who has submitted questions. So our first question for today, what is your favorite coastal tree species and why? Wow, this is, this is a question that is difficult to answer because there are just so many interesting coastal tree species that I actually like. But if you ask me to really choose what is my favorite coastal tree species, I think I would say the Podocarpus polystachys, which is the sea pig like I mentioned just now. Uh, because personally, I have never been to temperate countries. I've never seen the temperate forest or any like real coniferous tree. So like by right now, right here in Singapore, I can I'm able to actually see one real coniferous tree. I think that's very fascinating to me. Yeah. And also I also love to look at the cones, right? And at the back of the cone, at the mature cones, you can see the red receptacle. I think it's very cute. Uh. Yeah. And also the very narrow, narrow, like uh narrow shaped leaves, right? Uh it looks like just like the grasses that we see on the on the on the roadside we see. But then right now I'm seeing it hanging on the tree. So I think that that is very fascinating and that's very interesting to me. Yeah. So the Podocarpus polystachys. Okay. I yeah. I definitely second what Bossing said. There's just so much you know um that we have in Singapore. They're all super fascinating. But I got to say, uh, the Kedrina has to be my favorite coastal tree species. Uh, so when I was managing Coney Island Park, I have very fond memories of going to, you know, the seawall area uh, that's at the west promenade of the park. So 
highly recommend it for everybody to go check it out. So when you sit there after, you know, about after 3 p.m., you know, to sunset, uh, before the park closes, of course, um, it's just a lovely spot to sit beneath the casuarina tree as they sway in the wind. You have, you know, a beautiful sea view as well. And uh, just, you know, enjoy the beauty of the forest. Yeah. Wow, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. All right, our next, next up, we have a two-part question that's about conserving coastal forests. So what, what are the current threats to Singapore's coastal forests? And what can we do as a community to play our part in conserving them? So I think both of you uh, mentioned some pointers related to this question already uh, during your sharing. Perhaps you can share a bit more on, on these threats and or elaborate further. Okay, uh, so I think just now as we have mentioned, um, the non-native species, I think definitely is one of the threats that is, uh, that is threatening the Singapore's coastal forests. Uh, actually, it's also likewise in any other uh, secondary or, or secondary forest in Singapore as well. Uh. So the all these non-native species such as the uh, Macarthur's palm that is in Labrador Nature Reserve, or even the Batman plant like what Perlin has uh, talked about, about in Coney Island. So I think all these invasive species or these non-native species is potential, can potentially actually uh, smoldering the other mature plants or native plants within the coastal forest itself, like all the other native trees. And yeah, so actually it will actually slow down or hinder the regeneration of the forest. So that's why like what you can do actually on your part to really help us to conserve or help Singapore to conserve the coastal forest really to come to help us in the invasive species management. Yeah, because like as I shared earlier, like the invasive species management actually really can uh, help to, to allow the forest to regenerate on its own naturally. Yeah, and on the side note also at the same time, uh, definitely it was also uh, like certain threats such as like human tramp uh, people trampling uh, off trail because when we go off trail we create a new trail and many people step on the same trail it be the soil become com becomes compacted and then uh, no no seedlings or no seeds can germinate in, in this compacted soil yeah so actually this also actually hinders the uh, regenerations of uh, of the coastal forest itself yeah Yeah, I think I just want to jump in and, you know, second what Posting said again. Um, and, and I think we both cannot stress the importance of staying on designated trails, uh, not going off the trails and going to our forest. So like I shared in my presentation, Coney Island Park is home to a lot of different rare species. And we definitely want them to be able to, you know, um, uh, disperse and, you know, be able to establish and regenerate and, and some people, and when you go off the trail, you may unknowingly, definitely unintentionally, uh, be trampling on these really rare, uh, rare plants, um, and you know, pretty much, yeah, not allowing them to actually establish properly. And also, I think it's really important to remind everybody here that when visiting our parks and gardens, uh, to pack out whatever you pack in. So you know, take out everything that you bring into the park with you. So that's including your trash. Uh, please don't leave them behind in our green spaces because um, it's really unfortunate that um, we have seen, you know, many instances of trash being left behind. And I said earlier, you know, Kony is very popular with our wedding photographers and I think we welcome you. Uh, but um, unfortunately, uh, we have seen, you know, confetti being thrown into the forest uh, and that's very difficult to remove after that. And on that note, I want to share that we do have a lot of, you know, coastal cleanup programs um, that various organizations are organizing. And I think you guys, uh, it, it would be great if you guys can go check that out. And if you're interested, uh, definitely join them. I think they're always looking for people to help. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, I'll move on to the third question now. This one is about um, the biology of the plants at the coastal forest. So they are found near the sea and they have high soil exposure. Perhaps you can share a bit more about how these trees are able to tolerate uh, these harsh conditions. Wow, this is a very good question. So how does the forest deal with soil exposure? Uh, I think generally in this, in for coastal forest species, right, uh, currently it's not as well studied unlike the mangrove forest. So I think generally in mangrove, um, the it is very well studied. So in like the mangrove, how they deal with salt exposure is that they're either they are salt secretor 
or they, are, they can filter off the, the salt from the water when they take up the water. And so generally uh, for salt secretor in the mangrove, they are they able to secrete, they have these glands on their, on their leaves and then they're able to secrete the excess salt uh, on these glands. So if you happen to go to any mangrove, you try to lick or touch the, the leaves, right? You will be able to, it will be salty. La. So these are the salt secretor. And then for this, the ultra filtration wise, uh, the salt, the roots of the, of the mangrove actually able to, rem to selectively just take up the water and some mineral salts and, and not the uh, excessive salts from the water. So these are for mangrove, but for coastal forests, um, it's not still not it's still not much. Be, it's not being well studied currently, and there are not much uh, scientific papers on whether uh, how they deal with the salt exposure. Yeah, but it's a very interesting. It would be very cool to understand like, how they actually deal with this salt, salty environment. Definitely, yeah. Okay, thanks for that response, and understand that the research is still ongoing and. Uh, there's still a lot to be learned about coastal forest plants. All right, our fourth and final questions for, for today, um, due to the lack of time, um, is about places that we can find coastal forests. So uh, aside from Labrador Nature Reserve and Coney Island, where else in Singapore can we see rich coastal forest habitats? Okay, I think I'll go for it <laughs> uh, for this question. So yeah, um, there are definitely places where you can find, you know, other coastal forests in Singapore. And this includes, you know, like Bossing Shed, um, our parks and gardens. So our coastal parks, uh, such as East Coast Park and Changi Beach Park, where they also have, you know, casual, um, casual trees and other different coastal species uh, that you can go see. And um, also along our streetscape, definitely do keep a lookout for them, for coastal species in, uh, along our streets, you know, in neighborhoods that are very close to the coastal areas, you know, like Pongo area. Uh, yeah, and, um, and Labrador, that area as well. Yeah. Just let me add on also, I think uh, not only on mainland Singapore, but let's look at other islands along Singapore as well, like all the offshore islands. I think especially in Ubin, uh, I think Ubin itself has very diverse habitats. It has a mangrove and as well as a coastal forest. And Ubin, in fact, Ubin actually has a new coastal arboretum, which was announced two, two months ago. And it is uh, one hectare in size, but it will be a nursery for about 500 trees and about around 70 coastal species. And these species, uh, as they nurse these species, then they, after that, they will then enhance the coastal habitat on Ubin itself, and then also for the mainland Singapore. And that's for the northern, not the northeast part of Singapore. But over at the southern part of Singapore, we have the southern islands as well. And on all these southern islands, such as Pulau Samakau, Lazarus Island, St. John Island, Sisters Island, on all these offshore southern islands, they actually also have uh, coastal forests where there are also rocky cliffs and, rock and sandy beaches as well. So actually, you also can take a look at these off offshore islands that are open to public. And I think in particular, uh, in the offshore island, uh, there, is, there is a very interesting flora species, such as the uh, Villandina bulldog or the grey nickel plant. So this is very interesting because it is only known to be found in the southern islands. Uh. But now recently, we also have been bringing them on, uh, onto mainland Singapore, and we've been planting it in the Verdon Nature Reserve as well. Yeah, so these are some places that we can also find coastal forests in Singapore. Awesome. All right, with that, we would like to thank Bossin and Perlin for their insightful sharing and to our audience on Zoom and on YouTube today for joining us. If you found today's webinar to be interesting and would like to learn more, we would recommend checking out this virtual tour on coastal forests. You can access it via the QR code shown on the screen and we'll include a link in the Zoom chat as well. We would love for more people to join us in the One Million Trees movement and in growing our city in nature. So do visit our website, TreesSG, and connect, us, connect with us on NPARC's social media channels. You may also scan the QR code here to sign up for our mailing list. A million thanks to everyone, and we wish you all a great day ahead.